Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to read from verse 21. Ephesians 5, in fact, verse 22. Verse 22, begin with the words, Wives, submit you unto yourselves, unto your own husbands, as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself, for no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother, and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Amen. God will add his blessing to the reading of his word. Now here in Ephesians 5, as we noted last time together, we began to look at the importance of of Christian marriage. And here as we come to these closing verses in Ephesians 5, right through to Ephesians 6, verse 9, we're dealing really with one section. And in these verses, Paul deals with two different and two very important themes. Firstly, Paul deals with the importance of Christian marriage. And we know how important that is in the day and generation in which we live. And secondly, Paul deals with the importance of the Christian home, and we'll come to that at a later date. But in these changing times in which we live, there's no doubt that both of these subjects are of the utmost importance. And difficult though they are to understand and to apply to our lives, it's important that we take time to look at them biblically. First of all, We've been thinking about the importance of Christian marriage. There is no doubt today, and it can be seen all around us, that marriage and maintaining marriage is a very, very difficult thing. And unfortunately, both in the world in which we live and also in the church, we see the breakdown of many many marriages and not only has divorce permeated our world it has now permeated the Christian church and we need to deal with it uh, biblically compassionately because we realize that every marriage breakdown there are real people involved in this there are often children involved and there of course are extended family circles involved in this too so therefore resolving these issues are never never easy but here in Ephesians 5, we are going to concentrate tonight again on what the Bible says about Christian marriage. The standards of the world continue to decline regarding aspects of life where governments and other people change the word of God to suit themselves and how they want to live. But we in a changing world need to hear what God says to us through his word. Ephesians 5.21 says this, and this really lays the foundation for what we're thinking about. Verse 21, submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. And that lays the foundation for marriage as you and I understand it biblically. Now, we began last week to look at the background to these verses. Ephesians 5, 21 to 27, you can read it as I continue to talk for a moment but this is a very important passage 
and in our understanding of the whole concept of our age, we need to think about what it says. Because Paul, of course, writes these words in a background that was very, very different from the world in which we live. Paul was writing at a time when marriage was not deemed to be very important. The marriage bond was not held in any great esteem. And of course, Paul lives in a world where the background to these verses are coming to us from a very, very immoral world. In the Jewish world, Jewish men generally had a very low view of women in their society in the Greek world. The Greek man had a wife. He also had concubines and prostitutes. And in the Roman world, standards were so bad that the woman, the wife within the marriage, was seen to be nothing more than a plaything who was used and abused. So Paul comes from that background and he says to us regarding marriage, listen, as far as the Christian marriage is concerned, it not only needs to be understood, it needs to be treated seriously. Because when it's obeyed as the word of God declares it, that means that, first of all, the wife in society is lifted to a far better place. And not only that, but it will lead to fidelity, to purity, within the marriage bond, which of course was not happening in either the Greek, the Jewish, or the Roman world. So that's the background to these verses. But we picked it up again last week. We see the rules within the marriage bond. When we come to marriage, we recognize that this principle of submission in verse 21 is the launch pad, if you like, for what Paul is going to say about both husbands and wives. Both of them have roles that are distinctly different, and yet both of them live within a partnership that God will bless when things are the way that God wants them to be. And here, Paul identifies for us the two roles and what they mean. He begins with the wives. He says, wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. He says to the husbands, husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it that he might sanctify it and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. Now, when we see, first of all, the role of the wife, Paul sums it up. Verses 22 to 24. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. And Paul identifies for us here two things. There's the Lordship of Christ, and there's the headship of man. When you come to 1 Corinthians 11, Paul sums it up like this. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Now I want to go back to that particular verse again tonight. Because although Paul deals with all kinds of issues, issues that were important to the Corinthian church, here in 1 Corinthians 11 verse 3, he says something that is vitally important. I would have you know that the head of every man is Christ and the head of the woman is the man and the head of Christ is God. Now, I reminded you last time, Paul reminds us that God has an order for everything. And that means he has order for creation and authority within both the home and in the local church. Now, when I said that last week, someone said to me, but how on earth can God be the head of Christ? Well, I'm going to explain that because it's important to our understanding of marriage. Firstly, God is the head of Christ, and he's not saying in any way that the Lord Jesus Christ is inferior to the Father, because that's certainly not the case. And Scripture would tell us tonight that that can never be the case. Colossians 1, for example, the Apostle Paul says this of Christ. Verse 15, Christ is the image 
of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. For by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Now, how on earth can the Lord Jesus Christ be subject to the Father when Paul says here clearly that the Lord Jesus Christ has supremacy over all things? Christ reflects the Father. He reveals the Father. He's not only a representation of God. He's the very manifestation of God, co-equal in his nature and his attributes, his will, and in his works. So what on earth does Paul mean when he says that God is the head of Christ? Well, he means this. Although Christ is equal to the Father, in order to carry out God's plan and purpose in the whole area of redemption, God redeeming a people unto himself, the Lord Jesus Christ took a subordinate place. In other words, he obeyed what the Father had asked him to do. Do you remember how when the Lord Jesus Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, not long before he was arrested and then subsequently taken and nailed to an old rugged cross, what did the Lord Jesus Christ pray in the Garden of Gethsemane? He simply prayed, not my will, but thine be done. So the Lord Jesus Christ takes a subordinate place as he obeyed the will of the Father who had sent him into the world to be the Savior of the world. Paul sums it up again like this with these great words in Philippians 2. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men, and being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So in other words, in order to fulfill the will of the Father who had sent him from heaven, although it has to be said that the Lord Jesus Christ lovingly and willingly came in order to carry out God's great plan of redemption, Jesus took the subordinate place and he obeyed what the Father had asked him to do. In that sense, God is the head of Christ. Secondly, Christ is the head of man. Now that doesn't really need much explanation, does it? But it's so important to stress this in passing. What the Lord Jesus Christ did in fulfilling the plan of God in redemption is the pattern that the Christian must follow in their daily life. You say to me, what do you mean by that? I'll tell you what I mean by that. The Christian is subject to authority. And for those Christians today, and there are some who have said to me in the past, Pastor, let me tell you something. Nobody will tell me what to do. Well, if that's your understanding of the Bible, and that's your understanding of your relationship with Jesus Christ, you have a problem. And you have a misunderstanding of Scripture. The pastor who was here on Sunday morning used the verse that I will use again tonight. You and I are all under authority, male and female, and our head is the living Christ. And we are not our own because we have been bought with a price. I'm not suggesting there's anyone sitting in the meeting tonight who feels as I have said, but let me say this for those who do. Never forget that a ransom price has been paid to buy you and me out of the slave markets of our sin. 
that whether we're male or female, it matters not every single one of us are under the authority of Christ. That's why Paul says, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me, which simply means, but Christ who lives his life through me. Just as Christ submitted himself to the authority of the Father, so we are to submit ourselves to him. God is the head of Christ. Christ is the head of man. Man is the head of woman. Now let's be very clear about this because some men totally misunderstood this and they misrepresent it. When we say that man is the head of woman, it's not because the woman is inferior to the man. It is simply because God has given leadership or headship to the man and his order of You see, as far as personal worth is concerned, there's no distinction between man and woman in the eyes of God. I've met men all down through the years at every situation, home and abroad, and when they read a verse like this, they treat their wife as if she was an inferior being. They almost walk all over the top of them. And if you went down to somewhere like Eastern Europe, where that's the culture, the believers there have to be taught this because they've been brought up to realize they're the head of the house, children sit there, wife you sit there, and I'm the boss. Now, I know we don't have to go to Eastern Europe to find that, but it's wrong. We do not make our wives to be either insignificant or inferior as far as our personal worth is concerned, as far as God's order is concerned. Two different things. And God has given headship to the man. I understand we live in changing times and I know tonight probably something or anything I say it'll be misrepresented. However, I'm not here to hammer the woman in the church. In case you didn't notice, I live with one. But whatever society says and whatever it cries out for with all the changes in our society, beloved, listen, we have to be honest with the scripture. We have to be honest with the Bible, whether some like it or not. God in his sovereignty has given headship to the man, not because the woman is inferior to the man, because she isn't. Not because she's less spiritual than the man, for in so many homes, the opposite is true. In a number of marriages and in so many churches, the wives are often more spiritual than the husbands. And in some cases, that's so because the husbands will not take the lead. And not because she's less active than the man in her Christian duty. Because I'll tell you this, and statistics prove it in most churches. That the wives and the women are far more committed to the Lord's work than the men and their husbands. Beloved, if those statistics are true, where are the men today who are biblical? Where are the men today who are supposed to lead their homes? Supposed to be a man? who looks after his marriage and looks after his wife. See, beloved God in his sovereignty has given headship to the man. That's God's order. And he expects us to respect his order and to submit to it. Dr. Campbell Morgan, who many people acknowledge to be the prince of all expository preachers, once asked a lady in his congregation who was getting on in years he said to her one day, have you ever considered marriage? That's a very dangerous thing for any pastor to ask any woman. 
But he asked it anyway, and she turned around and she said, oh, many times. But I could never find a man who could master me. Beloved, this is not about mastering anybody. When it comes to marriage, it's about respect. It's about partnership. It's about accepting God's order of things, whatever others might say. Paul says, but I would have you to know that the head of every man is Christ, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of Christ is God. And if that's God's pattern, then we need to recognize it. And as best as we can, seek the grace of God to accept it. Now, let's come back with your Bible open here to Ephesians 5. Because what we've thought about really prepares the ground for what now Paul's going to say in Ephesians 5. So that we might understand our roles better as husbands and wives. See, here's the thing. The fact is that any man, any man who does not live under the authority of Christ cannot expect, and he has no right to expect his wife to live under authority to him. And any woman who does not accept the husband's authority cannot claim to be living under the authority of Christ. So what do they do? They should both understand their position in Christ. They should both appreciate their partnership together. But at the moment, we're concerned with the role of the wife. Since Paul is speaking here, and I have no doubt that he is speaking in the context of Christian marriage, when we look at the wife's role, within the marriage in relation to her husband and in relation to her family, she has a vitally important role. You see, you ladies who are sitting here tonight, and you're married ladies, I want you to understand just how important your role is. In the context of a Christian home, Paul speaking about Christian marriage. So there are a number of things that are important. Let me say this regarding the wife generally for a moment. If I'm going to be killed at the door, I might as well finish it. But regarding the wife generally, the wife must have a personal faith in Jesus Christ. That goes without saying. Because there is no place in Scripture for an unequal yoke. We are told that believers are to marry only in the Lord. Secondly, the wife is to leave her family ties. That doesn't mean that she breaks off all ties from her loved ones. It means that she has left one home in order to set up another home. And now she has her responsibility to her husband. Thirdly, the wife should be more concerned with her inner spirituality than with her outward beauty. Peter Satch's argument in 1 Peter 3, Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of their wives. Whose adorning let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair and of wearing gold or putting on a pearl, but let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Peter, God, is more interested in inner qualities displayed through a spiritual life because people take note of that kind of person. It's that kind of testimony and godly behavior that will not only build up her husband, but it will glorify God. The wife should show an attitude of submission. I want to tell you this, wives, and I tell it to all the young folk who come to me to talk about marriage. That will not be easy. 
There will be times when your husband will annoy you. There'll be times when you'll find it hard to deal with. And it'll be the most difficult thing in the world to take a submissive place or role within the home. That's the way that you honor your husband. And the wife must learn to stand by her husband, to support him, to use that Old Testament word in the book of Genesis to be a helpmate in every way that she can. Love of the husband and wife must work together in marriage because in every sense of the term, it's a partnership. But God says that the man is to take the lead in the home, the wife is to be submissive to the husband, and I think, I think, that you will find that a wife's submission comes much easier within marriage. Whenever she's respected, whenever she's loved, whenever she's cared for, and whenever she feels the protecting arms of her husband round about her. Some ladies might say to me tonight, Pastor, I understand all that you're saying, but why should I submit to my husband? Give me one good reason. Because the Bible says it. Submit yourselves one to another in the fear of God. Another translation puts it like this. Submit yourselves one to another in what? In reverence for Christ. And if you take that, that exhortation here in verse 21, and if you think of what we have considered regarding a spirit-filled life, then a spiritual woman in reverence for the Lord will take her place in God's order, and she will do it as unto the Lord. Let me say this, men, in passing. Because some men assume that because a wife submits to her husband, he can treat her like a doormat. That's not what I'm saying. That's not what the scripture teaches. Headship for the man is not a license to dominate his wife in a spirit of fear, to lord it over her as if she doesn't matter. She does matter. And when she knows she matters, and when she knows that she is loved, and when she knows that there's no fear in the home because of a loving husband, I'll tell you this, that will lift her to a higher place. All over the years of my ministry, I've had to bring sometimes couples into my home because that was the only home they were allowed to go to when perhaps a lady got out of a shelter because of a husband. Vice versa, sir. Beloved, listen. Everything about the role of the husband and the role of the wife, it should all be underlined with the word love. Love. Ladies, I want you to understand this. You're so important. As you learn to serve your husband and realize that you have a very important part under God. You see your marriage as a partnership that needs to be treated with love and dignity. The role of the wife. Let's come secondly and we can see the role of the husband now. It's interesting that Paul has far more to say about the husband than he has about the wife. Why? Well, Paul says here, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the saviour of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives. Love your wives. 
even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The husband is the head of the home. He doesn't act as a headmaster at school. His wife is not one of his pupils. He has no right to treat her shabbily. He has no right to treat her in an authoritarian way. God recognizes him as the head of the home. That's his God-given place. And everything that flows from that should be on a spiritual basis. For the husband, let me say a few things to you before we look at the specifics here in Ephesians 5. First of all, he must also know Christ personally. He must be committed to him. His words, his walk with Christ should be deepening, developing, and his wife should be able to look at him and see a spiritually minded man. You say, Pastor, that's a great challenge. So it is. You see, then the night you do want to come out to the prayer meeting and you send your wives out in your place. Think about that. Think about that. You're the head of the home. You and I are supposed to be spiritually minded men. We're supposed to give the lead. We're supposed to encourage our wives spiritually. So he must be a man of integrity, honest, faithful to his wife at all costs. He must not neglect God-given responsibilities. I do, and I've probably done it, and I regret this greatly. But sometimes men are so busy doing this, that, and the other thing that they neglect their God-given responsibility. They allow their wives and the wives have no other option but to lead in the home and everywhere else because the husband's never there. Now, I know these are difficult times. And I know we all have to work for a living. But if we hand over all our responsibility to the wife and the home, we're not doing the right thing. He must make wise and good decisions and take care of his wife. He must have a humble, gentle attitude toward his wife, and that just means watching out for her continually. Do you know why he does that? Because God holds the woman or the wife in the highest of esteem. And God says to the man, you have the great responsibility to care for your wife. Those are what I would call general things. But when you read here these words that Paul uses in Ephesians 5, and whenever you understand the submission of the wife and the leading of the husband, all of it is on the basis of love. Because we read here that husbands are told to love their wives. We're commanded in Scripture, of course, aren't we? To love the Lord our God with all our hearts, with all our souls, and with all our minds. Mark 12, verse 30. We're commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves and to love each other in the family of God. Those are all commands in Scripture. You and I can't walk away from those responsibilities. We are commanded by the risen Christ, the living head of the church. And now comes another command. Paul says that not only should husbands love their wives, but he describes the kind of love that the husband should express to his wife. And I'm sorry, but I'm going to leave it there tonight for this reason. The things that Paul says really demand a close look. And we don't have time to do that in three or four minutes. So I'm going to leave it there tonight. We'll come back next week. I know that this past few weeks we've been visiting missionaries and that has sort of thrown everything on its head.
but from now right through to Christmas, from every Wednesday night, and we'll come back and we'll finish this chapter 5 and bounce it to Ephesians 6. Let's just pray for a moment. Our God and our Father, in coming to these delicate, important issues tonight, we're very aware, our Father, that we must not misrepresent the Word of God. And we must understand, each of us who are married, the importance of the marriage bond and the partnership that exists between the husband and the wife. And Father, we pray that as we just think about your word together, that you would lovingly teach us, make us the husbands that we need to be, make us the wives that we need to be, and help us, our Father, in all things, to make sure that your word is paramount in our lives, and love is paramount in our homes. Please help us to this regard, we pray, in the Saviour's precious name. Amen.